Hey, it's Miss Smith. Today you're going to learn about a new STEM job. Today you're going to learn about architects. An architect is a person who designs buildings and prepares plans to give to a builder. Now, what he or she designs is called architecture. And architects make drawings with pens and pencils and also computers. This is called drafting. Now, sometimes they first make this small toy size building. This is called a model. And the model shows what the building will look like when it's all done. Now, architects need to decide the size, the shape, and what the building will be made from. They need to be very good at math and drawing, and they need a very good imagination. So that's not all. They need to know how to make the building's structure so that it won't collapse, and how to make it look nice and attractive so that people will want to use it. So they have a very important job because his or her work is going to be used and seen by many people for a very long time. If the design, materials, and construction are very good, the building will last for hundreds or even thousands of years. But rarely this is the case. The reason why is that buildings cost a lot of money, and sometimes that limits the architect and what they can use to design the building. They may not last because they will just collapse, um, or other times fire, war, or people just wanting to change the fashion or the way the building looks will affect if the building stays. The biggest thing, though, is that as towns and cities grow, it often becomes necessary to have roads, airports, train stations. All of these things require space, and sometimes buildings have to be knocked down. Even the nicest and most important buildings have to be knocked down to make these changes. When these changes are needed, they call in an architect. An architect can show them what to do and how to set things up. Um, so that it's more modernized and it's more convenient for the people who live there. So, as you can see, architecture is a very important profession. Now what we're going to do is we're going to read. You're going to learn about a little boy who wanted to be an architect, and he did when he grew up. And he started off just like you guys, in the classroom. So, I hope you enjoy this read aloud. This book is called Iggy Peck Architect. Iggy Peck Architect by Andrea Beattie, illustrated by David Roberts, read by Miss Jill. Young Iggy Peck is an architect and has been since he was two, when he built a great tower in only an hour with nothing but diapers and glue. Good gracious, Ignatius, his mother exclaimed. That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. But her smile faded fast as a slight wind blew past, and she realized those diapers weren't clean. Ignatius, my son, what on earth have you done? That's disgusting and nasty. It stinks. But Iggy was gone. He was out on the lawn using dirt clots to build a great sphinx. When Iggy was three, his parents could see his unusual passion would stay. He built churches and chapels from peaches and apples and temples from modeling clay. At dinner one night, to his father's delight, Iggy got a bright gleam in his eye and out on the porch built the St. Louis Arch from pancakes and coconut pie. Dear Ig had it made until second grade when his teacher, Miss Lilla Greer. On the very first day, she had this to say, We do not talk of buildings in here. Gothic or Romanesque, I couldn't care less about buildings, ancient or new. She said in her lecture about architecture that it had no place in grade two. That might seem severe, but she was sincere, for when she was no more than seven, she had a great fright at a dizzying height in a building so tall it scraped heaven. On an architect's tour of the 95th floor, young Lilla got lost from the group. She was found two days later, stuck in an elevator, eating cheese with a French circus troupe. After that day, it's quite safe to say, she thought all building lovers were nuts. 
as a teacher she taught that above all one ought to avoid them no ifs ands or buts as you might guess it would cause iggy stress to hear such terrible talk but he didn't hear he sat in the rear while building a castle of chalk you iggy peck your desk is a wreck tear down that castle right now you will not build in here is that perfectly clear do you need to see principal how no ma'am iggy said he lowered his head and his heart sank down to the floor with no chance to build his interest was killed now second grade was a bore after twelve long days that passed in a haze of reading and writing and arithmetic miss greer took the class to blue river pass for a hike and an old-fashioned picnic they crossed an old trestle to a small island nestled in the heart of a burbling stream but they no sooner passed than the footbridge collapsed and miss lilla greer started to scream we're trapped here oh my alas kids goodbye her eyes rolled back in her head she dropped to the ground with a vague groaning sound luckily fainted not dead the class was amazed they stood there quite dazed uncertain of what they should do but one bright young man was off hatching a plan which started with miss lilla's shoe soon each lad and lass there at blue river pass was working together as one and when she came to miss lilla greer knew that something quite brave had been done she looked in the air and saw hanging there a structure with cables and braces and on the far side beaming with pride were seventeen smiling young faces. Boots, tree roots, and string, fruit roll-ups and things, some of which should not mention, were stretched ridge to ridge in a glorious bridge dangling from shoestring suspension. It all became clear to Miss Lilla Greer as she crossed that bridge over the stream there are worse things to do when you're in grade two than to spend your time building a dream. Now, every week at Blue River Creek Elementary in second grade, all the school kids can hear, along with Miss Greer, how the world's greatest buildings were made. The weekly guest speaker, in a t-shirt and sneakers, talks of buildings from Rome to Quebec, and of course, he's the guy who builds towers from pie, that brilliant young man, Iggy Peck. The end. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the story. So in the story, Iggy Peck Architect, you learned about architecture. Uh, Iggy designs big towers, houses, buildings, churches, monuments, skyscrapers, and in the end, he built a bridge using only the materials available to him. He had to understand how to build it to be strong enough to carry the weight of all of his classmates. So how do architects and engineers design bridges to be so strong? In this next clip, you'll learn how they do it. Squeaks and I were just playing with some blocks. You know, it may not seem like it, but the cities and towns that we live in are all built using the same rules as our little pretend village over here. It's just that the real ones are bigger. And one of our viewers, six-year-old Hannah from the UK, wanted to know how some of the things that we build stay standing. So she sent us a really great question. Why are bridges so strong? Excellent question. Sometimes when a road or railroad track needs to go across something big like a river or a deep valley, experts called engineers design and build bridges to do that job. And 
bridges can be really busy. Take, for example, what's said to be the world's busiest bridge, the George Washington Bridge in New York City. Look at all those cars and trucks. It has to be pretty sturdy to carry so many people and cars. For a bridge to carry that much weight, it has to be built of special material like iron and steel. But it takes more than tough materials to make a strong bridge. So let's look at how bridges work. One very simple kind of bridge is called a beam bridge. When we say simple, we really do mean simple. A beam bridge can be just a log that you use to walk across a stream. Or put a long strip of cardboard between two short blocks. That's a beam bridge too. All bridges can hold a certain amount of weight, but what happens if we put too much weight on a beam bridge? Let's find out. It collapses. So a bridge that carries trucks and cars, which are very heavy, would have to be stronger than a bridge that carries bikes or people on foot, which are lighter. So how do we make stronger bridges? Well, over time, people have learned that certain shapes can be used to make stronger bridges. Take a look at this railroad bridge. It has to be strong because it carries trains. What shape do you see? That's right, triangles. And that's not by accident. The fact is, triangles are really strong shapes for building. If you put force on one side of a triangle, it bends. But if you put force on its point, it keeps its shape. That's because the two sides of the triangle are pushed down by the force, and the bottom gets stretched out to both sides. Each side feels the force, but none of them bends. And this makes the triangle a really sturdy and stable shape. This is why you'll see lots of triangles and bridges, both above the part that you actually travel on, called the deck, and below it. The long string of triangles that you see in a bridge is called a truss. Trusses help a bridge spread out the weight that it has to carry. But not all bridges are made of trusses. If a bridge has to cross a really wide body of water, it might be too difficult or expensive to build a truss bridge. So engineers design another kind of bridge called a suspension bridge. The Golden Gate Bridge in California is a great example of a suspension bridge. Suspension bridges work by using a force called tension. Tension is just pulling something tight. Suspension bridges are made of a deck that's hung or suspended from thick cables that stretch from one side of the bridge to the other. These cables are supported by tall towers and then are held down tightly or anchored on both ends. Suspension bridges are strong because the force on the bridge gets spread out. The weight of the cars or trains or horses, whatever's traveling across it, pulls on the cables creating tension. Those cables then pull down on the towers and also pull on the anchors on either end of the bridge to hold up the deck. I could go on and on about all kinds of clever bridges, but basically bridges are strong not only because they're made of strong materials, but also because of the smart designs dreamed up and planned by engineers. So thanks for asking Hannah, and thank you for hanging out with us at SciShow Kids. See you next time. So in that video, you learned how Iggy Peck knew which bridge type he needed to use so that it would be strong enough to get his teachers and classmates across. So in the story though, Iggy also built tall buildings. Now I have to wonder, when I build block towers or Lego skyscrapers, my designs may fall right over. So I'm going to ask, how do architects design tall skyscrapers that are so strong they don't even collapse during an earthquake? Well, in this next clip, my friend Justin is going to explain that to us. Ah, get to an earthquake! Just kidding! Today, I want to show you two ways how to make an earthquake-proof building. Hi, my name is Justin. I've always wondered what the natural disasters are and how people die in them. So I researched about earthquakes. As I researched, I found out that it's not earthquakes that kill people, it's the buildings that collapse on the people when they're inside. So I started to wonder, what can I do to help reduce the amount of people that die in an earthquake? So I did a lot of research and I talked to people in different companies and I found two building techniques used by architects and engineers to help a building withstand an earthquake long enough for the people to get out safely. The two building techniques are base isolation and tune mass damper. So I wanted to find out if these techniques actually work and if I could build a model to show how effective they are. To test these properly, I built a shake table. So let's start with the tune mass damper. We got this idea from Taipei 101 in Taiwan. The tune mass damper is often used in tall structures. It's a heavy weight that's suspended on the inside of the building to help minimize the movement and vibration. It's time to make my buildings and test it out. 
I used pieces from my Engino construction kit to make two identical structures that are three stories high. I built my tune mass damper putting 12 washers on the eye bolt and screwing the nut on. I built an extra part on the top of this building so I could suspend the tune mass damper on it. Now it's time to test it on the shake table. See how much of a big difference there is? The building with the tune mass damper stays pretty steady and doesn't wobble or bend too much. Check out the building without the tune mass damper. It swang like crazy! This seems to work because when the building sways one direction, the tune mass damper moves in the opposite direction and pulls it back from swaying too far. Some of the variables that would change the outcome of this experiment is the height of the tune mass damper. If it's too high, it will not make a difference, and if it's too low, it will swing too much. Also, the height of the building makes a difference, and the weight for the tune mass damper. If it's too heavy, it might crush the building, and if it's too light, it won't make a difference. So, it looks like the tune mass damper is very effective at minimizing the movement and vibration in a tall building. Now, on to our second building technique, base isolation. Basically, you're taking the building and lifting it off the ground and putting a shock absorber between the ground and the building. It isolates the building so it won't move as much during an earthquake. There are many ways to do this, but we like the straddling pendulum technology by Straddling Pendulum Limited in Alaska. We measured and cut our test unit out of cardboard. This was tricky because we had to be as exact as possible in our cutting so it would fit together well. Dad helped me out by using an X-Acto knife to cut with. Once it was assembled, we put it on our shake table with heavy books on top to simulate the weight of the building. We put another test building beside it, but with the base sitting directly on the shake table. We put a container of water on top of each so we could see what the difference was between our buildings. Look at the difference between them. We found that when we moved the shake table slowly, it didn't make much of a difference. But when we shook it quickly, it made a huge difference. This worked because the swinging plates absorb the energy from the shake table, so it minimizes the movement to the building. One of the variables that would change this experiment's outcome is the height of the legs of the base isolation unit. In fact, we made a shorter base isolation unit and it wasn't nearly as effective as the taller one. The other thing that made a difference was how accurately you cut your materials, what it's made of and the weight of the building on top. So base isolation is a good technique to use when you're trying to make an earthquake resistant building. Based on our two experiments, I can say that yes, it is possible to make a building that will withstand an earthquake using either base isolation or tune mass damper. I think tune mass damper is best for skyscrapers and tall buildings. And base isolation is better for houses and banks and other buildings that are lower. A special thanks to Larry Bullis at Straddling Pendulum Limited. He gave us tips and lots of advice about how to make the base isolation unit. It's great to know that there's technology like base isolation and tune mass damper that can save people's lives when an earthquake hits. I hope you learned as much as I learned from this. Thanks for watching our video. Bye! Wow! Justin just taught us a lot about making tall buildings strong. Another thing you might not know about Iggy Peck, though, is that he used a process called the engineering design process to design his structures. So an architect is a type of engineer. An engineer is a person who designs and builds things to help solve problems. Well, architects solve problems all the time. Like a city might need a bridge with specific requirements. For example, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco is about 9,000 feet long and carries 110,000 vehicles every single day. Well, a city might also need a place for people to go and relax outside, so 
like in the late 1800s, New York City was getting so big that they were running out of space. City officials were really concerned because it became packed with people and buildings and industries. It was running out of green space. So they hired a landscape architect named Frederick Law Olmsted to come in and design Central Park. Central Park is now one of the largest and most well-known parks in the whole world. Skyscrapers and elevators were invented by architects to help save space as well. So in New York, instead of buildings being built across the land, they're now being built up into the sky, saving space. But these are very big ideas that take a lot of planning. That is where the design process comes in. In this next video clip, you're going to learn about the design process and get the inside scoop on how architects and engineers come up with incredible things. I'm going to take a wild guess and say you've probably used the phone. And I bet you've enjoyed the benefits of a little thing we call air conditioning. You know who made those things possible? Engineers. We were just talking about engineers in our last video, people who design and build things to solve problems, and there are lots of different kinds of engineers. No matter what type of engineer you want to be though, civil, mechanical, electrical, or a kind that doesn't even exist yet, there's a series of steps that all engineers follow when they're trying to solve a problem. This process is called, wait for it, the engineering process. Makes sense to me. So what sort of steps are included in the engineering process, and why do we need it? Let's go through it step by step and discover how awesome things are made. First thing you gotta do is just define the problem. I mean, before you can solve a problem, you have to figure out what it is, right? For example, back in the 1800s, an engineer named Alexander Graham Bell was trying to come up with a simpler, cheaper way for people to communicate. Back then, the best you could do was a telegraph, which was an old-fashioned system of sending messages over electrical wires. Bell identified his problem. Communicating with people who are far away was expensive and took a lot of time. So his invention, or solution to this problem, was something you may have heard of. The telephone. Nice. Now, once you've figured out what problem you want to tackle, you need to do your research. You can start by just making a list of questions you have and what information you need to start answering them. You can also look around and find what other things already exist that have tried to solve this same problem. Maybe they can be improved. A good example here is the man who helped us blow stuff up. The chemist and engineer Alfred Nobel invented the explosive known as dynamite. Not because he particularly enjoyed explosions, but because miners and other people who, well, needed to blow stuff up to do their jobs, needed an explosive that was safer to use. So before he started on that problem, Nobel did research to see what explosives already existed, which ones worked well and which ones didn't. This takes us to step three. Develop a solution. After your research is done, this is where you say exactly how you think you can solve the problem. And once you've thought of a good solution, you have to figure out how it'll actually work and what it will look like. So you have to design your solution. This is where you get to draw. Civil engineers always sketch out their ideas, like buildings and bridges and towers, to show what they'll look like when they're done. Gustave Eiffel designed the famous Eiffel Tower in France, and he definitely showed up on day one of construction knowing exactly what it was gonna look like. On to step five, build a prototype. A prototype is just a simple model that lets you test out your design. It can be as big as the real thing's going to be, or it can be a smaller version. You just need to have a prototype so you can test it. This may be the most important step in the whole process. Engineers need to test their design to see if it works like they want it to. So say if your building's a big tower, does it stand up? Does it stay standing up? If you're designing something with moving parts, does it work the way you want? Now take it from me, my future engineers. You might have a great idea, a really terrific solution to a really big problem. But when you get to this step, your prototype probably won't work exactly the way you want. At least, not on the first try. Most engineers test their prototypes over and over and over again. That's why a lot of time and brain power goes into the very last step evaluating your solutions. Evaluating just means asking yourself whether things are working the way you want, or why they are, or aren't. I like to think of this step as question 
everything. This is when engineers review all of the facts and ask themselves questions, followed by even more questions. What worked well? Why did it work? Why didn't it work? How could it be made better? And most of the time, the answers to these questions are going to send you back several steps. Like, once you figured out why your prototype wasn't working, you'll have to design a new solution and then build it and then test it again. Sometimes engineers go through this process four, five, even six times or more. Take Willis Carrier, the inventor of modern air conditioning. He tested his prototypes for years before he figured out the design that worked the way he wanted and solved the problem he wanted to fix. Like all engineers, he failed a lot before he succeeded. And that's okay because he learned something from every failure, which made his product even better in the end. And I, for one, am glad he kept going. So the engineering process is a series of steps that engineers, or anyone, should use when they're facing a challenge. The process is important because it allows engineers to experiment and also to fail. Both of these things give engineers a chance to go back and improve on their original idea, giving us something even better down the road. So the next time you fail at something, don't feel too bad. Think about the telephone and the air conditioner and the Eiffel Tower, and then try again. Okay guys, well today you learned about how architects construct buildings and bridges and how they help to solve problems. You also learned that they did this by using something called the design process. Well, now it's your turn to be the architect. Here's your STEM challenge for today. Everyone needs to get out a pencil, a ruler, crayons, or colored pencils if you prefer them. You're gonna be handed a piece of paper that looks like a map. It has a river, a harbor, uh, and land all around it. So this is the future town of Cahabaville. In this challenge, you are an architect, and the city planner of Cahabaville has asked you to design the city. They're going to need a lot of things. They need bridges to cross the rivers. They uh, need roads, buildings, parks, homes, stores. They need everything. There's nothing there. So you're going to use the des design process. So the first thing I want you to do is look at the map. Where is the best place for everything? Where should I put bridges? Where do skyscrapers for businesses need to go? Where should I put stores? Uh, how am I going to save space? Am I going to make room for a park? I've got to have roads. Got to have neighborhoods. Maybe some boats on the harbor. So I want you to think about it. Think about where you should put things and why you should put them in the places that you chose. And then Take a few moments, imagine it on the paper, and then I want you to draw it. Draw the skyscrapers, draw the bridges, draw the boats, draw everything. And once you're finished drawing, I want you to color it with either the crayons or the colored pencils. Do a very neat job because if you are a real architect and it's really, really sloppy, they're not going to want to go with anything you design and then you won't get paid. So you want to make sure that it's super neat. All right, so let's get started. I hope you enjoyed this STEM challenge today, and I'll see you again next week.